We will now proceed to our first panel discussion, a new social contract in the age of artificial intelligence. As a critically important framework for society in the age of artificial intelligence, the social contract 2020 concept is based on balancing power among all stakeholders and among governments, businesses, civil society, individuals, and artificial intelligence platforms. The social contract 2020 is a commitment of main stakeholders to uphold common values and international standards and protect intellectual property. The COVID-19 pandemic, as Dr. Muniz pointed out, has demonstrated that collective challenges require cooperative response. So it is therefore now more important than ever to analyze and discuss in a multi-stakeholder setting the interaction between artificial intelligence and new technologies and measurements and policies adopted by governments, international organizations, companies, and societies. This makes consideration of a new social contract on digital governance and the reinvigoration of multilateralism and global cooperation imperative to ensure work towards inclusive society across politics, governments, economics, business, and industry. Our introductory session, a new social contract in the age of artificial intelligence, will present an overview of state-of-the-art developments on a new social contract for 2020, raising the key issues which will be addressed throughout the remaining days of the policy lab. This initial exercise will be framed by Professor Thomas Patterson, Research Director of the Michael Dukakis Institute for Leadership and Innovation, Bradley Professor of Government and the Press at, Harvard, at the Harvard Kennedy School, and author of a, of a number of books, including the fabulously titled, How America Lost Its Mind, The Assault on Reason That's Crippling Our Democracy. I now have the pleasure to invite to the floor, Professor Patterson. Please come forward. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to represent the Boston Global Forum at this timely and important conference. Uh, before I start, uh, please note the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question about anything that's said in this session, uh, please use the chat uh, feature to, to submit it. Even though we're only in the beginning of the AI age, it doesn't take much imagination to recognize how fully it's going to change our lives. Think about self-driving cars, for example. Uh, they'll improve fuel economy, efficiency. They'll turn our time in the vehicle uh, from concentration time to work time and leisure time. And so once we get accustomed to not controlling the wheel, uh, it'll, they'll actually reduce the stress of driving. Uh, and that's but one example out of scores that I could give you about the way that AI is going to change the way we live and the way we relate to each other. Now, most of these changes are going to take place in the private sector, uh, but the public sector is also going to change. Uh, AI will revolutionize the delivery of public services. We'll get efficiencies through faster and less bureaucratic mechanisms. We'll get better targeting places of need, something that we're already seeing uh, in the COVID. And we'll get more equitable distribution. Underserved populations can finally get their fair share. And the public service revolution well, not only one way, it won't be just simply from government to citizen. AI will create more opportunities for citizen influence, not just around elections, but in real time in feedback response to particular government actions and policies. Change in the public sector will undoubtedly occur more slowly than it does in the private sector. That's typically the case, and I think will be doubly so with AI. AI depends on algorithms and data. Right now, much of the data that government would need to avoid the potential of AI is proprietary, controlled by private firms. There's a need for government to enlarge their investment in data gathering and to receive from private parties data that does not threaten their business models, but relates to key 
public policy interests, such as health and safety. Legislation to that effect, by the way, is currently waking, waking its way through the Congress of the United States. Now, AI has great potential to better our lives, but it also poses risks to privacy, self-determination, and human rights. In the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we saw the expansion of the democratic model, not only in Eastern Europe, but in South America and elsewhere. I think the optimism of that period has faded and new technologies are one of the reasons. Surveillance technologies based on AI have enabled authoritarian regimes to more fully and easily monitor the political opposition, track people's text messages and their social media posts, block access to material critical of the regime, spread disinformation. AI is helping authoritarian regimes to become more durable. In the 1990s, the median lifespan of such regimes was about 10 years. Now it's double that amount. A study by the Mass Mobilization Project found that the most durable authoritarian regimes are the ones that make the most use of surveillance technology to track and control their people. And as you know, Governments are the, not the only ones that are exploiting AI. That's also true, for example, of tech companies that manipulate consumer choice and malicious actors that spread disinformation and discord. Such concerns led the Boston Global Forum to conclude that there's a need for a new social contract, one fitted to the AI age, and that seeks to maximize the benefits of AI and to minimize the technology's exploitation. If not the first such contract for the AI age, it's among the first. We developed a consultation with a wide range of organizations, scholars, and public leaders, and we're deeply indebted to their contributions. We envision our social contract as a living document one that will need updating as knowledge of AI increases and as we hear from others about what we've overlooked, undervalued, or misjudged in drafting our contract. Now, a basic assumption of social contract theory is the power arrangement that individuals would willingly accept, not knowing in advance whether they'd be among the more powerful members of society or among the weaker members. John Locke, one of the first social contract theorists, answered that question by positing a society that protected life, liberty, and property through lawful restraints on those in power. Locke's theory contributed to the emergence of liberal government, government by law, rather than by the dictates of those in authority. Subsequent social contracts responding to changes in society helped to lay the foundation for representative democracy ruled by the majority and for social democracy, economic security as a right rather than a privilege. Society is changing again in response to the effects of AI and other advances in technology, changes that are fundamental enough to warrant a new social contract. Now, our starting point in thinking about the nature of that contract was the rights and interests of ordinary people. That's where social contracts typically begin. They are rooted in the rights and interests of individuals and what governments and other entities must do and are prohibited from doing in order to safeguard those rights and interests. Let me list some of the individual rights that the Boston Global Forum believes need to be protected in the digital age. One is the right to privacy, which is threatened in many ways by advances in AI. Recently, our home city of Boston banned the use of facial recognition technology by police. That's a stark contrast with China, which seeks to apply it universally. 
When you get a new cell phone in China, for example, it can't be activated until you submit to a facial recognition scan. A second right that we see as basic is the right of each individual to control their personal data. Data are a source of power in the digital age, and that power needs to be used to benefit the individual. That doesn't mean the walling off of all personal data. Many of the benefits of AI derive from having it. But it does mean that individuals control their sensitive data, have opt-out rights, have to give informed consent before others can use their data, and must be protected from harmful uses of their data. A third right is access. Included here would be meaningful access to the internet or mobile communication. As industrialized nations have ever moved, have moved ever closer to full internet penetration, concern over the digital divide has diminished. But the problem still exists in many of these countries and elsewhere. Half of the world's population doesn't have internet access. And even within wealthier countries, disadvantaged individuals often don't have it. When US schools shut down in mid-March of this year, many children in our inner cities and poor rural areas, estimates vary as high as 20%, effectively ceased going to school because they lacked online access. A right of access would impose on government the obligation to provide that access. A right of access would also require government to provide education and training in digital literacy. And it would preclude government from blocking access to sites critical of those in power, a practice that's on the rise in many places. When protests flared earlier this year in Hong Kong, China basically shut down access on the mainland to messages coming from that city. Now, there are other individual rights that might be added to our list. For instance, the right to share and profits from the use of one's data. The Boston Global Forum is still in the process of thinking through the implications of such possibilities. And then there are some things that we left off the list because they're precluded by what's on it. The right to be free of hacking, for example, is subsumed by the rights of privacy and control of one's personal data. Now, once fully defined, the rights in the social contract would impose restrictions and obligations on government, some of which I've already mentioned. As well, government should, for example, create laws that promote transparency and accountability in data usage, that protect the privacy of personal data, and that bring people more fully into the policy decisions affecting them. Earlier social contracts, for the most part, addressed only the rights of individuals and the obligations of government. But there are at least three ways that a social contract for the AI age would depart in degree, if not in kind, from those earlier ones. One is in regard to the power of private parties. The threat to privacy and control of one's data is not solely coming from governments, it comes also from search engines and social media platforms like Google and Facebook. Through either regulation or transparent and accountable self-regulation, they would be required to conform to the norms of the social contract. Their largely unchecked power is already an issue and will become more so. The COVID pandemic, for example, has led firms to develop new and powerful so software to track the disease, that's beneficial. But we shouldn't assume these firms will discard the software once the pandemic recedes. A safer assumption is that they will repurpose it and it may not be for beneficial purposes. Transparency is a cornerstone for much of what's in the social contract. Without government regulations mandating transparency, the risk of manipulation is high and abuses will be hard to detect and rectify. And without transparency, the public trust upon which society depends will be in short supply. A second difference from earlier social contracts is the cross-national dimension 
of the digital revolution. With earlier social contracts, it was necessary to think only of a particular nation state and whether it was adhering to principles and norms. But data like the coronavirus doesn't respect national boundaries. The UN and other such organizations will need to be active participants in upholding principles and norms. And the third difference is unique to the digital age. Although AI is still in its infancy, we already have machines that do some complex tasks better than people can do them. We need to make machines accountable through, for example, transparency in regard to their capabilities and uses. Let me finish with what I see as a shortcoming in efforts to craft a social contract for the digital age. Historically, the power of a social contract has stemmed from its ability to give people a vision of a different and better society. John Locke's vision was a society governed by rule of law, an enormously attractive idea for people who had known only the arbitrary rule of kings, mandarins, and priests. Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract envisioned government by the common will, the vision of self-government, majority rule, sparked revolutions. So too did Edward Bernstein's democratic socialist vision of a society where wealth is more widely shared. Nothing similar has emerged in the writings about the promise of the AI age. A lot has been written about the type of society that we need to avoid, the surveillance state. But not much thought has been given to the type of society that we should be trying to create. If our story is simply one of protecting people's privacy, I'm not sure it will inspire them to act. There are countless historical examples of people willingly trading their privacy for what they see as greater security. We saw that, for instance, in the United States after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, when Americans broadly supported legislation that gave their government broad new surveillance powers. The same can be said of efficiency arguments. There's no doubt that AI will lead to efficiencies of all sorts, from the delivery of public services to the production of consumer goods. People won't object to these developments, but they will take place through an incremental process that will proceed without much public attention or involvement. If we're going to build the needed public support for a new social contract, we need to start imagining the digital age society that technology at its best can help us create. Thank you for listening to the social contract in its entirety. I invite you to look at it on the Boston Global Forum's website bostonglobalforum.org. Thank you. Thank you for this insightful analysis and your visionary efforts, Professor Patterson. We're really pleased that you will now be joining our panel discussion led by Ramu Damodaran, Editor-in-Chief of the UN Chronicle and Chief of the United Nations Academic Impact an initiative of the United Nations Department of Public Information's Outreach Division. Ramu Damodaran also serves as Secretary of the United Nations General Assembly on Information. He has served in UN Departments of Peacekeeping and Special Political Questions, as well as the Executive Office of the Secretary General. While a member of the Indian Foreign Service, Damodaran was promoted to the rank of Ambassador. Prior to joining National Government Service, he worked extensively in the Indian mass media including television, radio, and print publications, including as a news anchor and a disc jockey. His radio feature, Echoes of a Generation, was awarded the Asia Pacific Broadcasting Union Prize. Welcome, Ramu Damodaran, for our first panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Milburn, if I may. It's a proud moment for me at the United Nations to see UN 75 in the backdrop to, to your uh, to your remarks, Milburn, the fact that the Club de Madrid and the Boston Global Forum and other partners here are commemorating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. In fact, when I think of the motto of the Club de Madrid, 
of democracy that delivers and that of the Boston Global Forum of ideas that matter, I think the two put together really synthesize the idea of the United Nations itself. Today, the 16th of September, is actually a pivotal day in United Nations history. One third of a century ago, on the 16th of September, 1987, the Montreal Protocol, which reduced the depletion of the ozone layer, which protects our planet, was signed. And since then, in the last 33 years, it's become the only legal instrument in United Nations history to be signed by every member state of the United Nations. And so meeting today on the 16th of September is a happy augury because we might well have created the seeds of a truly universal social contract in this age of artificial intelligence that respects, as Dr. Patterson reminded us, the principles of trust, the principle of transnationality, the principle of accountability by inanimate objects, most of which are also integral to environmental laws like the Montreal Protocol, which will allow us in the next 20 to 40 years to restore the ozone layer to the condition it was in 1980. Uh, you, Milburn, have spoken about a human rights-centered constitution. And I think that phrase really sums up what we are trying to do in the social contract respecting the rights of humans to their dignity and to their worth, as the United Nations Charter puts it, without infringing or compromising on the dignity of work of others. And I think we have a stellar panel with us today, apart from uh, Professor Patterson himself. I'm proud to have with us the former Prime Minister of Lat Latvia, Valdis Birkavs, who, before he became Prime Minister, was the president of the Latvian Bar Association, the first bar association in the then Soviet Union. He became president in 1988, which helped usher in the era of democracy, not only for Latvia, but for all the other then constituent republics in the USSR. We have Jerry Jones, who is the executive vice president and ethics and legal officer of LiveRAM, who will be bringing us perspectives, both from the point of view of the private sector and of the state within a union, a state within a nation, uh, in his particular instance, the state of Arkansas in the United States. And our very first speaker, who will be joining us by video, is Nuria Oliver, who is, among other things, an IEEE fellow, a fellow of the ACM, and a member of the European Union's expert group on data sharing. So we really have a formidable panel and, and I think what we're looking forward to is exploring what the Club de Madrid president Danilo Turk once described as not just horizontal multilateralism, but a vertical multilateralism that brings in every aspect of society, including elements of society we were unfamiliar with, certainly in 1945, like AI and which the Club de Madrid, the Boston Global Forum, with Governor Dukakis and my good friend Tuan, have done so much to further. This is also going to be a very democratic discussion. We look forward to the questions that any of you may have for the panelists. Please use the questions tool, which is available to you, to send in questions, and we'll try and get as many of them into the conversation as we can. So let me begin by giving the floor to Nuria Oliver. Hello. I'm Nuria Oliver, a chief data scientist in Data Pop Alliance, chief scientific advisor to the Vodafone Institute, and co-founder of ELIS, the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligence Systems. Artificial intelligence is at the core of the fourth industrial revolution and is profoundly changing the world that we live in. Because of its transversal impact to every aspect of life, when we talk about AI, we have to consider five key pillars to ensure that the development of AI will actually be positive to everyone in our world. The first pillar is the investment in the technology, in research and innovation related to um, the actual uh, algorithms that uh, are at the core of AI. The second pillar is a change in the legal and regulatory frameworks to tackle the new reality where 
automatic processes will be and are already making decisions. The third pillar is ethics. There are numerous ethical challenges raised by autonomous AI-based decision-making systems. The fourth pillar is the societal pillar and the education pillar. We need to make sure that we leverage AI for positive societal impact, and we won't be able to do that if we don't invest in education at all levels, from a profound transformation of the compulsory education system to upskilling and reskilling programs for professionals to educating citizens and decision makers in this very important discipline. And last but not least, we have the economic and labor dimension. How can we really embrace AI so it represents progress? It means that we are actually creating a better world for everyone, and we're not leaving anyone behind, including the transformation that it entails of the labor system. So as Stephen Hawking said, AI can be the best or the worst thing that happened to humankind. Let's work together to make sure that is the best thing. Thank you. Thanks so much. That's that's a, a wonderful overview for our conversation. Let's hope it is the best. And I think you've given us ample reason, uh, Ms. Oliver, to suggest it could well be the best. I'm now going to put a question to each of our other panelists uh, in turn. And I hope that they can then elaborate upon this in the sense of either directly commenting upon it or sharing other ideas that they may have. And I'll begin, if I may, with Jerry Jones. You also spoke, Ms. Oliver, about what have you called the intersection, if you will, between culture, ethics, and the law. And what I would like to ask you, um, Jerry, if I may, is when you have a situation where governments, by, by mandate, define the law, and you have an exuberant private sector taking advantage of factors like artificial intelligence, how and where does regulation come in? Where and how could government either limit the private sector or give private sector the capacity to enhance for the general good? Your reflections on that would be valuable. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for the opportunity to participate today. Um, your question is, is very, very timely because one of the one of the challenges that we have is that government moves at one pace and technology moves at a fundamentally different pace. Um, our democrat democratic institutions by design tend to move very slowly. They're deliberative processes. They take in lots of inputs from different aspects of our societies, regions, countries, and, and the entire world. Technology moves exceptionally fast. And for regulation to be effective, it's got to be relevant to what it is trying to regulate. A couple of examples, um, you know, in terms of how fast technology moves. 20 years ago, the cost of DNA sequencing of the genome was about $100 million. Six years ago, it had gotten down to uh, a hundred dollars. And I hear now that there's a company that can do it for around $25. Uh, computer chips have gotten to be 90,000 times more energy efficient, 60,000 times lower in cost, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sensors are being placed into not only jet engines to determine when they need some maintenance, but big belly garbage cans to determine when the garbage uh, trucks need to show up and be optimized. And the reason that these things are happening so fast is one, just the way that science moves forward and technology moves forward, but also the corporate form is able to adapt and shift and be agile much, much more rapidly than governments can. Um, the setting of standards by regulators um, is also a critical ingredient. Standards are good in the sense that they can create a marketplace, but they can also be very restrictive. A good example is what happened with the cell phone standard in Europe that was initially outstanding because it allowed people to migrate from country to country using the same cell phone. 
and be able to communicate. But the problem was that the European standard just didn't carry enough of the communication load. And there was a company in the US, Qualcomm, that figured this out and realized that if they spread the communication, and I won't go into the technology, but if they spread the communication along the bandwidth differently and then brought it together on the, on the back end, uh, you could vastly increase the capability of the communication channel. Um, and this was necessary because the iPhone had come around and all of a sudden AT&T found that its uh, network bandwidth requirements went up 100,000% in just a handful of years, 100,000% change in the amount of bandwidth that was needed for communication. So what the Qualcomm inventors did was they looked out into the future and realized that there was this tsunami of communication that was on the horizon and they built for that change curve uh, as opposed to building for the current state of the condition. So the, the fundamental problem that we have is um, we're running out of time, a fundamental problem, not just the, but we're running out of time to get our arms around how we should regulate in these issues. I'll give you an example of the issues that come up with not acting fast enough. Um, everyone has heard of Uber. Well, imagine that the founder of Uber went to the first lawyer and said, I'm going to create this thing that's going to displace taxis and you know, the cars are going to be cleaner and they're going to be more ubiquitous and it's going to be cheaper, but I don't want to put up with regulation. And the first lawyer said, well, okay, you're going to create a taxi company. You're going to have to pay from a day and you're going to be regulated and you're going to be taxed and you have to have a license from the jurisdictions where you want to operate. Well, that founder rejected that advice and went to the next lawyer and the next lawyer said, you know what? I think you have a great idea. And what I would tell you is run faster than regulation. Go get people to use your service and they're going to love it because it's cheaper, it's faster, it's cleaner, et cetera, et cetera. And you know what? That's what they did. And so those who wanted to regulate Uber were at a fundamental disadvantage because they thought the regulators thought that they had the power of the law being a government, but they didn't have the power of the people. And the power of the people had already voted on what they wanted. And so there was this collision. Um, and I use the Uber example just as an analogy of what we're facing um, in, in terms of trying to regulate technology and in particular, artificial intelligence. You know, we're living in a world where the future is going to get us so fast that human beings are having a hard time to adapt to it and to accept it. Um, it's kind of like raising kids though. If you don't do a good job of instilling values and ethics in children, when they were children, it sure is hard to catch up after they become um, teenagers and young adults. It's very, very hard. So you have to get ahead of it. Uh, our ability to change and our reluctance to accept change also has very profound implications for democracies in general. Because as we enter this, and we're experiencing this age of rapid technological development and advancement, it's outpacing. Um, human's ability to accept change. We haven't evolved much as human beings in the last hundred years. Technology certainly has. And what it's doing is it's revealing a conflict between those who want to get off the fast moving train that's headed to the future and those that just want to hang on to the good old days of the past. When we move from horses to cars, we could take some time in developing the rules of the road. Uh, we really can't take our time on this because the incline of the curve has fundamentally changed. And hopefully that we can rapidly come up with guidelines for the future before it's past us. Uh, 
you know, there's that old Faulkner quote along the lines of the past is not, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Well, in technology, it moves past us. And as evidence of the rate of change in how government is trying to catch up, just this morning in my morning feed was a reference to a 23-page um, United States uh, House of Representatives concurrent resolution on expressing the sense of Congress with respect to the principles that should guide the national artificial intelligence strategy of the United States. I haven't had a chance to read it. I don't know whether it's any good or not, but, um, you know, the U S Congress is trying to catch up because it knows that it as a body is behind. Um, I don't know that I've answered your question, but those are my thoughts in the morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jones. I think it's, it's not only, if I may say so, answer the question, but also thrown open a whole new set of questions, which I hope that all of us in the audience will reflect upon and perhaps discuss. And as I said, I, we look forward to your questions for the panelists through the questions tool. Now, one thing you mentioned about how dramatically this exp exponential growth of uh, 100,000 times in AT&T bandwidth, in some ways, we're seeing exactly the reverse now with the pandemic. The idea that rather than expanding human opportunities and human capacities, governments are being compelled to narrow them down and restrict them, perhaps to a point where factors like artificial intelligence will be needed for surveillance for the greater common good to prevent the spread of disease. And this is the question I'd like to put to Prime Minister Birkavs in your leadership of Latvia and as a global statesman. Do you ever fear that emergency measures which governments are taking at a time like this in 2020 will somehow become the rule of expected law and become permanent rather than temporary? Could you reflect on that, sir? Thank you very much indeed. I think that any time uh, when crisis happen, it breeds uh, practically upheavals, intellectual and social upheavals. And uh, having in mind political perspective which comes from COVID-19, we should very briefly, very, very briefly look back, look to the Black Death, which resulted in collapse of feudalism and birth of Renaissance. Look back to Spanish flu, which destroyed old world order and created generation, lost generation. What we expect coming from COVID-19, is it such a scale crisis which will create the same death of consequences? When Professor Harari known, well-known historian, was asked what will be place of COVID in next history books. He answered, it will not be reflected at all. And then added that only thing which is very significant is that this is time when AI and digital technologies are stepping over threshold behind which digital technologies will have ability to understand people better than people understand themselves. And taking into account that any pandemia has worked like giant collider, we can expect very unexpected consequences. From my point of view, and as lawyer, I see very clear parallels. 
because uh, between climate, climate change and digitalization, we have our gadgets and all the digital environment around us daily, everywhere, all the time, already. We are living with, like with climate. And this climate has its own CO2, like hacking, its own tsunami, like fake news, its own raising of temperature, like uh, platforms, social platforms, uh, social networks. And it means that our way how to cope with coming problems and already existing problems are very similar. What we are doing, trying to cope with climate change, that is, we need more and more understanding, we need more and more new instruments, new platforms, we need more and more legal regulations, and we need more and more international agreements or other forms of cooperation. But regarding regulation of our limitations of our freedom, I think we should take into account that there is only one way how to balance it. It's democracy which delivers and there is only one way to try to keep it and develop. But everybody knows that bad guys are operating badly. Good guys, nevertheless, have temptations to keep power, to be longer in power, nevertheless, to realize their pro promises. And it means that any kind of limitations finally should be legalized and not as ordinary laws, but as constitutional at least. In any case, speaking about current coming changes, we should understand that they will be deep and sometimes very unpleasant and sometimes very successful like it had been historically in previous pandemias despite the all, all tragic situations which we had or humanity had then. Only what we can do is do what once Martin Heidegger said. We, in such a conditions, we need high tension intensity to build mindful future. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. And I think the, the remark you made about how AI and factors like that might help people to understand themselves better than people themselves can is a very important portent for the future. And it allows me to widen this discussion to one between the three panelists whom we've heard, and also Dr. Patterson who will join us for his own thoughts and comments. And uh, let me begin by asking a question of uh, Ms. Oliver, which is, you know, the very idea of data pop is so cross-generational because data is something you think of as 
stolid, old, firm, reliable, and part of something which is very new, young, and immediate. So reconciling the two of them, do you see that there is a generational dimension to factors like AI? Are people who are younger either less inclined or possibly more inclined to take advantage of it, while people who are more established, including in political leaderships, are a little more guarded? How would you react to that? Oh, I'm not sure, actually, I beg your pardon, whether we have Miss Oliver with us, So, uh, because I realized that she was in a video presentation. So maybe I should then refocus this, uh, this question to Mr. Jones, and using the same premise, go to the, was it, was it Faulkner, the quote about the past is not even the past just as yet? Uh, that, that's a fascinating thought as well. And I wonder, could you reflect upon that in the sense of within your own personal experience, both at the state level and at the, at, if I may say so, the global intellectual level. Have you ever found that even as we move forward and come up with new discoveries and new innovations, we do have to anchor ourselves in a past that we have not wholly left behind? Sure. And uh, that's, that is a fundamental issue. Um, clearly, we cannot abandon the foundational institutional frameworks that the world has put together over the last couple of hundred years that have led to um, an amazing uh, amount of prosperity for the human race globally. Um, you know, everybody knows that we are so much better off now than we were 200 years. There's actually less conflict now than there was 200 years ago. And the international alliances, uh, particularly after World War II, have served us quite well. But those are starting to be frayed, and they're starting to be frayed at many levels. Um, some of the young people don't understand the conflicts of the past and wonder why uh, those of us who have gray hair still talk about World War II and, and Korean War and the Vietnam War. And, um, the wars of the Middle East, um, things that we have to work very hard to uh, prevent from occurring in the future because they just haven't been educated and, and grounded in those things. Um, in, in my own company, um, we have uh, about 1,100 people that are our colleagues, and the vast majority of them are under 30 years old. Their appreciation for technology is fundamentally different than mine. They grew up utilizing technology, and um, their mantra is that, you know, technology rules and that they can affect change by utilizing technology. Uh, just yesterday, there was a protest directed towards Facebook by celebrities going um, cold or dark on Instagram, trying to get Facebook to change some of its policies. So, there are different ways of people collectively coming together to exercise power, utilizing the technologies that are available now to where they go to the digital street and not necessarily the physical street to direct change. The physical street, though, however, is very visible and it can have a more immediate impact because it is physical where the digital, it's there, you sense it, but it's not in your face as much. And so how we promote demographic change by using these different tools, it's, um, you know, it's in transition and it's a little bit of both. What is important however, is that for democratic institutions to be able to maintain the, the absolutely necessary legitimacy that they need to be effective as we move through the future is to be able to be not only transparent, but also responsive. And the whole point of my introductory comments was that part of being responsive is dealing with an issue with dispatch. In the U.S., we have a fundamental problem with the way that our Congress is acting uh, collectively over the last decade or so. The political division is so stark that it's very hard to find the common ground. And without finding that common ground, you cannot get anything done. You just can't get legislation passed. 
um, I was talking about um, you know federal efforts to come up with a comprehensive United States uh, data privacy law the other day, and I found an article from 2001 that said that it was imminent. It was imminent in 2001, and here we are almost 20 years later, and we have proposals, but we're not there yet. And that's an issue that's been percolating along for 20 years without the Congress effectively saying, we've got to do something. Here is what we're going to do. They've not done anything which has allowed the marketplace to basically set its own rules. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a fascinating idea about how we take time so much for granted. Um, I'd like to share um, Prime Minister Birkauf's a question which actually is coming from the audience and which also, in a sense, reflects the nature of this program between the Club de Madrid and the Boston Global Forum. That is, how do you see a transatlantic dimension to the future of global society, particularly the social contract in the age of artificial intelligence? Do you think such a concept is valid, the transatlantic one? I suppose that uh, both sides need cooperation. Transatlantic cooperation is vital for all the world because what is some kind of cornerstone of stability and good future. I have no doubts about necessity and positive influence of transatlantic cooperation. Thank you. Um, Professor Patterson, any thoughts from your side? I, actually, I'd like to pick up on, uh, or in his remarks, uh, Prime Minister Burkhaus stopped, and that's uh, building a mindful future. And uh, there are a couple of threads here that, that strike me as important. Uh, there was an early point about uh, income inequality and the growth in income inequality. And uh, part of that is related to these changes in technology. And as we look ahead, um, there's going to be more disruption. Uh, the efficiencies that we get through AI, uh, among their other consequences, uh, they're going to result in this, sh you know, the shedding of jobs. And, uh, We've already seen that with automation and it's just simply going to accelerate. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I think could happen is that we would look a little too narrowly uh, at kind of the technical uh, and regulatory issues, uh, which are fundamentally important. And I tried to stress that in my talk, uh, you know, transparency, accountability, you know, these are basic to our thinking about the AI age, but we also need to, kind of imagine uh, what kind of future we want. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to think about an alternative future to one where we have growing income inequality and increased job loss. Uh, and it reminds me in that sense a little bit about the Industrial Revolution, which uh, in, uh, in its early going had some of these same consequences, uh, uh, growing inequality, uh, loss of jobs, uh, change of the workplace that in ways that were not advantageous to workers. Uh, and uh, imagine futures, uh, what people thought about what society could look like uh, were fundamental to bringing about some of the important changes uh, uh, later in the Industrial Revolution period, uh, things like economic security and the like. So I do think that piece of thinking about what's, what change is bringing uh, is an area that really deserves a lot of emphasis and probably to this point is one we haven't given enough thought to. Thanks so much for that, uh, Professor Patterson. It also yields uh, another question which we've received from the audience, which is really the idea of a set of values, if you will, which will govern the management and the sharing of data. And in a sense, well, I'm not sure of the word exploitation, but using data for the general good. 
And maybe at the end of this, uh, this really enlightening segment, I could ask each of you to suggest one particular step that could be taken, either by national governments or by an international organization like the United Nations, or for that matter, by the intellectual or the private sector community, one step that can be taken to really make data available in the greater human and common cause. Uh, could I begin with you, Mr. Jones? Sure, and for those of you who don't know my background for the last 20 years, I've been a senior officer in a public company that is in the data field, both at Axiom and at LiveRamp. And at Axiom, we had a database that had between 1,500 and 2,000 data elements um, just about every economically active person in the United States, um, uh, as well as many other parts of the world. So I deal with this on a daily basis. And um, the, the, the two, two comments. One, uh, you don't always know the uh, full utility of the data that's being collected at the time that it is collected. And it's important to decide whether or not we're going to make data generally available for future innovation that's been collected in the past, or whether you have to go out and collect new data uh, to be a foundation for some innovation. There's a very important implication to that because the large platforms already have so much data available that if you have to go back and get uh, full consent for innovation for things that you hadn't thought about at the time that data was collected, they're going to rule and they're going to continue to rule. So I think that one of the, one of the very important things about um, a concrete step taken vis-a-vis -vis the use of data is to get our arms around the concentration of power that is evident in uh, just five or six companies around the world. Uh, Alibaba, Tencent, um, Facebook, Google, uh, and Microsoft in deciding whether or not we're going to let those companies set the rules or whether the broader um, society will set the rules on how data is going to be used. And I think that's a fundamental issue um, that uh, the Secretary of State uh, started, uh, he mentioned this morning, on um, taking a look at antitrust policy on how it intersects with the data usage and the network effect. Um, I think those are the two things that we ought to take very hard looks at and make concrete advancements on. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I really would like to again express, well, my personal appreciation, and if I may, the appreciation of the United Nations for the very rich discussion we've had because we're really, in many senses, wandering into uncharted territory in our 75th year, in the 75th year of the United Nations, and bringing in such a remarkable panel, a former prime minister, a practitioner in data in the private sector, a senior academician and scholar who has worked not only on the subject that we're immediately dealing with, but the larger media landscape in the world, and a young energetic professional in the, wheel, in the field of popularization and use of data has been a remarkable force. And I think that the ideas that you've put forward and above all the promises that you have held as possible to realize are going to be a source of great strength to us. And really, as the Club de Madrid says, democracy that delivers. And in a sense, the heart of that is the democracy of open, inquiring, and receptive minds. Thank you for being those minds, and thank you for catering to those minds. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.